couple of announcements. So, as you know, we have an extended lunch break today uh, in order to allow people who want to visit us, maybe visit or less, on the other side of the view, that you are welcome to come, right? Uh, unfortunately, the public transport is not operating <laughs> properly in Budapest today, but uh, uh, the, sh the, the fastest would be to, if you want to use public transport, to take the metro from the act here to Moscow here, and we are just two minutes from there, right? There will be people like Rosie and others who can guide you there if you, if you need guidance. Uh, if you want to have a lunch before you come, that's fine as well. It would be better because you know, not, not everyone comes at the same time, but it's up to you how you do that. Uh, get back here by 3.30 for the, for the, for the afternoon course. It was one of them, there was something else. How long will it take to walk there? To walk there it's about 40 minutes. And uh, we are actually in uh, uh, maps uh, at the registration if you want to go with that. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'm happy to uh, introduce the next speaker, Susan German today, who, who actually offered us three different topics for, 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 for her talk. And one of them was about genetics, the other was about essentialism, uh, and this is the third one. Uh, uh, so blame me, I chose this one because I haven't heard about this one at all, so I was really interested in what, what, what it's about. So, you know. Well, first I just want to say what a uh, sincere honor it is to be here with, at the opening uh, conference for this amazing center and uh, among these luminaries, it's uh, quite daunting as a speaker. Um, and I'm glad you said that about the three talks because um, I have to warn you that this is uh, has a high ratio of speculation to data, put it that way. <laughs> but I thought it would be good to get people's feedback about some, some ideas that I'm playing around with. So I want to start with psychological essentialism. Uh, which is an implicit belief that adults and young children seem to have that certain categories, a wide range of categories, tigers, females, gold, um, have certain properties that, that they're treated as real and not as human constructions, as unchanging and not flexible. They're thought to have some kind of deeper basis to them and even to have some kind of hidden quality or essence uh, that causes the observable features. Now this um, essence can be a placeholder, Doug Nadine talks about that, or it might get instantiated into uh, our beliefs about particular internal organs or substances. <laughs> essentialism has philosophical roots, of course. Uh, psychological essentialism is distinct from that, um, and in particular, <coughs> psychological essentialism does not involve claims about the real world, when I talk about essentialist beliefs, I'm not proposing that the world is structured this way. And in fact, it's very clear that um, psychological essentialism is a bias, um, and it's something that William James talked about uh, over a century ago. So just to give you a couple quick examples of how it can really lead you astray, um, nearly half the US population rejects evolutionary theory, and they say that it's just implausible that apes could transform into humans. Um, a belief that these categories are rigid and, and, and can't be changed. And if you ask, uh, this was uh, from a national survey um, of US adults, um, and they were asked to agree or disagree with a series of statements, and one of the statements was, two people from the same race will always be more genetically similar to each other than two people from different races, which of course is false, um, and most people thought that that was absolutely true. And again, taking, uh, in this case, the category of race as having some kind of essential element that all members share. Now, here are some of the behaviors that are interpreted as showing psychological essentialism in uh, different research. Uh, Frank Kyle had classic studies 20 years ago um, showing that adults and young children believe that um, 
for example, a raccoon cannot be transformed into a skunk, even if you change its superficial features, this is still a raccoon. Um, the belief that offspring have uh, very important similarities that are passed down from the parent, even though the offspring and the parent may look very different. Um, the belief that uh, this is a leaf insect, um, and so even though it looks very much like a leaf, uh, people believe that it's going to share properties with other insects because they're members of the same kind. Um, and the belief that all kinds of abilities and um, uh, properties are determined by uh, genetic substrates. So if you look at all of these examples, they look very biological. And in fact, it's this kind of observation led some people to suggest that essentialism is a special way of reasoning about the biological world. It may be a domain-specific module. So Atron suggested, in every human society, people think about plants and animals in the same special ways. These special ways of thinking can be described as a folk biology. For example, there's a common sense assumption that each generic species has an underlying causal nature or essence. And then Atron went on to, he, he acknowledged that, of course, uh, people essentialize um, social categories as well, and suggested that that's uh, an analogical transfer from the biological domain. And similarly, Boyer said that there's a causal essence imprint engine that probably evolved to afford quick induction about living kinds. So the idea is that essentialism is this particularly biological assumption. Um, I will argue instead that essentialism reflects a set of much broader propensities, that it's not strictly biological, um, either in terms of how adults reason, but also, more importantly, in terms of its origins developmentally. And I'm going to suggest instead that there are a set of capacities that um, contribute to essentialism, but none of them were um, specifically developed for essentialism. Um, and I'm, so I'll, I'll mention some, none of which I'm really going to get a chance to talk about, but just um, I'm going to talk about one capacity in particular today. But some of the other ones that may promote essentialism, um, causal determinism. So I have a picture of a baby trying to figure out how something works. Um, there's some evidence that there's, a, there's a, a basic human uh, propensity to think that regularities in the world and events in the world have some sort of cause. Uh, you may not know what the cause is yet, but you're going to, you, you can figure it out. Um, now, th there's a clear link from that to essentialism, where people are looking for the underlying cause or essence to a category. But it's certainly not restricted to reasoning about, about kinds. And you can see there are obvious more general benefits <coughs> for um, uh, fostering an approach to the world where you're looking for intervening mechanisms. Deference to experts also seems to be a really important piece of essentialism. But again, not specifically targeted just for essentialism. So. Um, with the leaf insect example that I gave earlier, when young children see all kinds of things in the world, they mislabel them. Kids will initially think that is a leaf. But the remarkable thing is that as soon as an adult labels it, they sh they're willing to shift their classification and make all sorts of inferences on the basis, on what would appear to be a very flimsy evidential basis, which is just the production of a uh, of an arbitrary sound from the adult. Um, but some work by Susan Graham and others shows that as early as 13 months, when children are first producing language, they also interpret um, uh, adult labels as providing particularly important cues about what things are. Um, and I think um, this may relate to the pedagogy idea as well. Then generic concepts also seem 
linked to essentialism, or at the very least, um, required for the kind of essentialism I've been talking about. And yet, generic concepts uh, are, are important for your, your capacity to extend knowledge. It's not just related to essentialism. Um, and we had that little bit of discussion at the end of Mike's talk uh, about generics. And uh, this was one of the other talks I would have given. Um, and after the little exchange right before the break, I, I just couldn't help myself. And I added in a couple of slides about generics just to, um, I guess, partly to plug this as a really important research problem that I think we've made some headway on, but there are still like, really big gaps in, in how we uh, understand it. So here's my short two-minute detour on generics. Um, and I guess the, the big point I want to make here is um, I'm going to be talking about generic expression in language. And I just want to impress upon you what a serious inductive challenge it is for the child learner. So we all know uh, Quine talks about uh, the problem of induction when it comes to simple extension, you know, pointing to a rabbit and the child interpreting the word rabbit. Uh, well, multiply that many times to see the problem with generics. So um, generics refer to kinds but allow for exceptions. Semantically, this is a challenge in multiple ways. One of them being that kinds are not observable units in the world. We never see, you know, I tell you birds lay eggs. I can never demonstrate and point and show to you birds. Uh, that's a, a, a conceptual unit, but it's, it's nothing out there. Um, you know, all birds, past, present, future, and hypothetical. Um, but furthermore, this ability to uh, allow exceptions makes them much more challenging than quantifiers um, to even articulate what's going on. And Alan um, talked about this, that some of this important work that Sarah Jane Leslie is doing. Um, and there's a long philosophical tradition of trying to understand how generics work. Uh, just intuitively, um, you know, we can say things like boys play with cars. And it, if you ask people, they think really only about 80% of boys play with cars, but they're willing to accept the generalization. They are willing to accept birds lay eggs, even though at most 50% of birds lay eggs, because male birds don't lay eggs and baby birds don't lay eggs. Um, and um, we can say ticks carry Lyme disease, even though that's true of only a small minority of the category. But you can't say that any um, property that's true 10% of the time or more can be expressed generically. Um, we say birds lay eggs, but you can't say birds are female, for example. Oh, there it is. Um, generics are not reducible to any particular quantifier, so if you try to argue that maybe generics just mean most, or maybe they mean some, you can find counter examples to all of those. Um, and it seems to be very much uh, tied into your understanding of the category that you're expressing the generic about. So if you ask people, do blickets have stripes, and 50% of your sample has stripes, They'll say yes if um, you have 50% adults, 50% babies, and only the adults have stripes. But they'll say no if 50% of the adults and 50% of the babies have stripes. Um, and then formally, there's no one-to-one -one mapping between form and meaning for generics. Um, so you can have multiple forms that all refer to the category each of which can either be used generically or non-generically. And you can really see that the morphosyntactic cues and the contextual cues are all really important for doing these interpretations. So do you like rice? It's generic, it means rice in general. Do you like the rice? <coughs> refers to a particular sample of rice is not generic. Do you want rice? That's not generic. Would you like rice? 
that's not generic. So simple modifications, you know, adding in the article, changing the verb, or um, changing the auxiliary. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. if you take that same unit and put it in a different context, would you like right? If you're a monkey, mm -hmm. then it becomes generic again. Mm -hmm. So these are all things that children have to learn. But as I said, I'm not going to be talking about any of this. So. <laughs> um, <coughs> what I will be talking about is children's attention to historical path. And that uh, is something that I think is really important for essentialism, but much broader than essentialism. And I chose this picture for it because here's uh, a baby holding a blankie, and there's uh, the well-known case that uh, children and their blankies have a very special relationship, and children really care about the particular individual blanket uh, that they have come to, to love, and you can't substitute one with another. So keep that example in mind because it's, it's going to uh, come back again. But we have to attend to historical path to trace individual identity, but we also have to attend to historical path to reason about essentialism, and to reason about how the same item is the same kind of thing over time. So I'll talk about historical path and its relation to identity. Uh, very briefly talk about, link it back to essentialism. Uh, and then spend a little more time suggesting uh, how this might relate to concepts of authenticity. Okay, so there are different kinds of cues that we use to determine the identity of an object. You can use featural cues. Uh, for example, if I wanted to get my coat out of the coat room and I lost my little tag, I could describe the coat and say, well, it's green and it has this fake fur around it and around the hood and so forth. And, and you could go identify the coat from that, on that basis. But um, a different kind of cue is spatiotemporal. So let's say that you're a spy and you want to uh, poison somebody's drink. So the classic thing is you have your two identical drinks and you pour the poison into one drink and then you shift them around when the person's not looking, but you know, based on spatial temporal cues, which is the poisonous drink and which isn't, featural cues wouldn't tell you. There are sortal cues, um, determining identity based on your knowledge about the kind of thing something is. So if I visit a friend, one lives far away, and one year they have a newborn puppy, and then I come back a year later, and there's this large dog that doesn't really look like the puppy, I will still assume that it's the same animal because I know about dogs and I know they grow. But if they had a small chair and then they had a big chair a year later, I wouldn't think that it's the same chair. <laughs> uh, and causal cues. Um, so let's say, say I'm uh, in graduate school and let's say this was, I don't know, 30 years ago before computers and I saw a big uh, pile of shredded paper in my office and um, I can imagine a um, process by which my, the single copy of my dissertation somehow got shredded, um, then I might worry that perhaps this is indeed my only copy of my dissertation because I know that there's a causal process that could transform one to the other. Um, I'm really going to only talk about featural and spatiotemporal cues, but uh, I wanted to talk about the others just so you know. Of course, it's a lot more complicated than just featural and spatiotemporal. So uh, the main point here is that featural cues can be misleading, uh, self-explanatory, uh, transformations. Uh, this is the American film director, Ron Howard. Uh, so if you wanted to find him nowadays, you, you would uh, be in bad shape if you're looking for somebody who looked like that cute kid. And there, there's this interesting syndrome, um, really a tragic syndrome, but um, interesting from the standpoint of thinking about featural and spatiotemporal cues, where um, 
<coughs> people have the delusion that either a close friend or, or a close relative, rare cases even themselves, uh, has been replaced by an imposter who looks exactly like the person but isn't the person. Um, uh, and then they, there's a variant of the syndrome where you might think that particular objects placed around your house are, again, exact duplicates. And I think what's going on here, one way of thinking about this anyway, is that the person recognizes the featural match. This looks just like my pair of glasses. Um, but they're denying the spatiotemporal contigu contiguity. So it's very disturbing to people because, you know, why has this, this object been replaced? Why has, you know, my husband been replaced by an exact duplicate? <coughs> So, so featural cues are problematic. Spatiotemporal cues um, can be a much more reliable indicator of identity than featural properties. So I'm going to uh, do a little demonstration based on, you know, apparent motion is a well-studied phenomenon, has been for many years. And uh, using PowerPoint, I'm going to, um, I want you to look, so these, these are going to move and or, well, they're not really moving. That's the point. They're, they're, they're going to look like they're moving, and I want you to tell me which way you think they're moving, uh, either vertically or horizontally. Oops. Oh, I'm that's, it's on the wrong button there. Okay. Sorry. Okay, so they look like they're moving, right? And who thinks they're moving up and down? Okay. And I, I'm not going to ask if anyone thinks they're moving vertically, uh, horizontally, because um, I don't want to embarrass you. <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, now you could have interpreted them as moving the other way, um, but the, the featural cues are telling you that they're moving up and down because really these are just two still images. This one and this one, but it's kind of, I don't know, maybe a Gestaltian good continuation or something that the, these are uh, featurally the same and these are featurally the same. So that seems to be featural cues winning out. However, if you disrupt the spatiotemporal contiguity, take exactly the same images, just increase the spacing, um, it looks a little different. Okay, so watch, oops. I'm sorry, I have to, it's a little tricky. Okay, now which, now how do you see them moving? Horizontally. Horizontally, right? And in fact, not only do you see them moving horizontally, which, which totally disrupts the featural uh, cues, but to me, it looks like they're changing features right in the middle. You know, of course I didn't discover this phenomenon, so it's well demonstrated, but it's, um, an interesting case where even as adults we use the um, we use the spatiotemporal cues to privilege them over the the featural cues. <coughs> and you could argue this should be especially true for children because they often lack the knowledge that you would need to know which features are relevant in a given case. And there's some uh, beautiful work by Shu and Carrie that shows this point with ten month olds. If it's been much research past this initial study, but for the point I want to make, um, uh, this, this illustrates the point. So if you show infants to barriers, and you show a duck coming out of one, and then a duck coming out of the other, and you don't show anything in the middle, they think there are two ducks once the barriers come down. Okay, now you do the exact same thing, but there's only a single barrier. They think there's just one duck. So they're very good at using spatiotemporal cues here. Now the critical thing is what happens when there's that conflict between the spatiotemporal and the featural cues. And the remarkable thing is that 10 month olds think that there's just one. Again, the featural cues seem to be more important. 
Now, more generally, I, I don't want to just focus on spatiotemporal cues. I'm really talking about something more general, which I'm calling historical path. Uh, and I want to introduce a little terminology so it's not too confusing. So with spatiotemporal cues, a person tracks an object through time and space firsthand. So um, if I wanted to make that link between an egg and the bird hatching out of the egg, I would <coughs> watch as this process unfolds in time. But historical path um, is a case where the person privileges spatiotemporal information but doesn't have to track it firsthand. So for example, um, I could ask uh, which bird laid out of the egg. Um, someone could tell me that. Um, and then I could use that information to determine the identity again. But I don't have to actually watch the process. And that kind of historical path information is important for a whole host of, of activities in everyday life. So, you know, um, the occluded objects like we saw before in Shu and Carrie's work, uh, finding lost objects like car keys, you know, we go, we think about uh, where was I when I last had them. Um, there's this beautiful work by Nikki Clayton showing that crows. Um, looked for cached food in the locations where they left them. Um, and that's Kripke, by the way. Um, applying proper names. Um, so Kripke makes a point that names are not definite descriptions. So um, for example, George W. Bush uh, as a name refers, it doesn't really pick out any particular set of properties. So like probably the primary description of George W. Bush, or one of them, is 43rd President of the United States. But you could easily imagine a case where that wasn't, in fact, uh, the true description. And it doesn't mean that he would fall out of existence or that whoever was the 43rd President now has to be called George W. Bush or anything like that. And there's sensitivity to. Um, this, this historical path information, uh, certainly by three-year-olds. Uh, Sorrentino has work on that. Um, so now I'm going to complicate the picture a little bit. I'll start with identical twins, which actually, this is not a problem at all. Uh, we consider them two individuals, and it seems to be a simple case of privileging historical path over featural cues. They may look identical, but they occupy different space-time coordinates, so they're two individuals. But mass-produced toys might be a case where spatiotemporal cues are not so relevant. Um, so this, these are, um, if you've seen the, the movie Toy Story, these are identical Buzz Lightyear figures. Um, and when you have a mass-produced toy, it's kind of like twins in that you have identical featural cues, you have uh, um, distinct spatiotemporal cues. Um, but in contrast to twins, they're all intended to be representations of the same individual. So we, we give them all the same name and children in different houses all over the world treat them as, as Buzz Lightyear. So this was the moment in the movie when he found out that there were all these other Buzz Lightyears. You can imagine that would be very disconcerting. Um, but we thought this would be an interesting case to test how strongly children endorse uh, attention to historical path. So this is a study that Grant Guffield uh, uh, was first author on. And we were particularly interested in these cases uh, where you have two objects that have the same name, the same appearances, and they're culturally intended to be representations of a single individual. But the, but the representations themselves are spatiotemporally distinct. So the question was how kids would think about them. Uh, as a control, we had two distinct animals with different names. This is Elmo and Blue. And then we also had two identical people with different names, Lisa and Mary. And of course, there's a fourth cell. We, we didn't include it. But you could get two different people who look different who happen to have the same name. Um, 
I'll go through the procedure with the poo pair as an example. One member of the pair would be in a room with a child, and the child, there would be some <laughs> event that the child participated in. Um, so she created a sticker picture in one room, and Pooh was there watching. Pooh number one was there watching. Then the child went into another room. There was uh, another Pooh, uh, and the child participated in a different event, hiding a toy car. And Pooh number two was watching. Then both Pooh's and the child are brought together into the same room. <coughs> And we asked the child about the knowledge state of, of the individuals as a measure of their personal identity. And you know, there are different ways you might want, want to measure identity, but we used it uh, looking at their knowledge state. Um, and so what the experimenter did was point to each Pooh in turn and, say, and said, does Pooh know what's in the sticker picture? Does Pooh know what's in the sticker picture? And does Pooh know where you hit the car? Does Pooh know where you hit the car? <coughs> these are four and five girls. So if they think that, okay, well, these are all representations of one individual, they really all have access <coughs> to the same knowledge because they're really just one individual dispersed through, through space, then they should think that both Poohs uh, know what's in the sticker picture and both Poohs know where the car was hidden. But if they're privileged, privileging the spatiotemporal cues, then they should think that each poo only knows what it saw. Um, and so here are the results for, separately for the three types of items. So this is when there are different items with different appearance and different names. And just as you would expect, um, they said that only the character who was in the room had knowledge to uh, what was going on. The one who wasn't in the room didn't. Then for the identical appearing dolls that had different names, again, they, they had no problem with that. The interesting thing was that even with the items that were identical and were, they looked identical, they had the same name, and they were intended to be representations of the same individual, they still used the spatiotemporal cues to uh, report what his knowledge base was. So it seems that there is this uh, early attention to these kinds of cues, and they can even override featural information. Now here's where I briefly want to just argue that this same kind of impulse underlies essentialism, and I'm going to talk uh, briefly about kind essentialism and what I'll call individual essentialism, uh, which is applying psychological essentialism to an individual as opposed to a kind, uh, and then go to authenticity and ownership. When children, or adults for that matter, are reasoning about um, kind essences of the kinds of tasks that I mentioned before, they seem to, this seems to require some uh, attention to the historical path of an item. So if uh, a baby kangaroo uh, goes and lives among goats and is raised by goats, children report that this kangaroo will uh, grow up to look like a kangaroo and act like a kangaroo. And it's that, again, that historical path that it was a kangaroo to begin with drives its development and, and nothing about the larger context. Or if you take the seed out of an apple and you plant it in a flower pot, Children report that the seed will grow into an apple plant. Um, and again, it's the origins that determine the, uh, how the, the kind of expression uh, manifests itself. And if I ask you um, to figure out what kind of thing something is, so we gave children, uh, Dave Lazat and I gave children a task where we showed them pairs of identically seeming items, and we said, you know, one of these is an animal and one of them is a toy, and I don't know which is which, how could I tell? Or one of these is a dog and one of these is a wolf, and uh, I don't know which is which, how could I tell? Um, 
children report that origins are more important than some other feature that's more relevant to the individual, such as the age of the item. And they don't do it when you're just asked about proper names, because when you're just, uh, the pro proper names are, the origins are, are, are not relevant here. At least anecdotally, it seems that for individual essence as well, historical path is critical. So uh, one way you can see this is with uh, organ transplants. Uh, someone actually did a study asking organ transplants, uh, organ transplant recipients, whether they took on characteristics of their donor. And over one third of heart transplants, tr transplant recipients report that they do, in fact, take on characteristics of their owner. Here's an example from a book that uh, came out a while ago. My new heart did seem to be affecting my personality. This new male energy did seem to be affecting me. Perhaps what still existed of Tim was his pure essence. Um, there was a news report that came out just um, about a month ago. It just like this, you know, this, this comes up periodically. You know, I never used to like french fries and then I got this new heart and suddenly I like french fries. Um, and there's even, I don't want to get too morbid here, but there's even this uh, product you can buy where you can uh, take your loved one's uh, remains and have them crushed down into a diamond that you can wear uh, because love lives on. <laughs> so, I mean, why should you even care about this? Well, the idea is that this having that bit of your, of your loved one with you at all times means that some important quality of them is still with you. Okay, this actually does lead me into authenticity. Um, and I'm going to show you a set of examples, again, purely anecdotal for now, but I'll, then I'll get to the studies. Um, that shows that there's a broad attention to historical path that goes far beyond biological kinds. So none of these are biological kinds at all. Uh, the classic example is um, works of art. We care terribly whether we have the original or a forgery. Uh, even if you can't tell the difference, you care terribly which one you have. It affects the value of it. There are historical cases <coughs> of um, things whose uh, uh, provenance changed over time uh, according to, you know, as, as new facts came out and the worth of, of uh, painting can go up and down dramatically based on whether it's thought oh. to be the original or not. Um, some really nice uh, discussion of this by Paul Bloom. And the idea here is that people seem to believe, perhaps, I mean, here's maybe uh, a rich interpretation of this, that there may be some non-visible quality uh, that's inherent in the object that gives it its identity and gives it its value. I'll return to whether that's what's going on or not. Even the merest trace of a significant individual um, can take on the significance. A signature. A signature represents about 500 <coughs> milliseconds of contact uh, between a pen and a piece of paper as guided by the hand of, in this case, Neil Armstrong, uh, walked on the moon, I think. Uh, this is apparently the most valuable uh, signature. Um, anybody know what this is? Aside from the fact that it's a styrofoam cup? See somebody's sweat or yard. <laughs> Elvis, who, who said it? Okay, Alan, you got it. It's uh, so an even mundane, ordinary object can take on special value. This apparently was a cup that Elvis drank from one of his last concerts, <laughs> including the water in it. Somebody claimed that they kept it in their freezer for 20 or 30 years. Uh, I don't know. I think the water would have evaporated myself, but um, they sold it on eBay. And. Um, again, even the you know things that are not of any intrinsic worth, uh, this uh, no certificate of origin to show that this is the authentic coal from the Titanic uh, and a piece of moon rock. Of course, it's you know enshrined in the Smithsonian. So uh, 
adults in um, kind of Western culture uh, seem to have this belief that authentic items are special in some way, that they're awe-inspiring, they belong in museums, they're worth a lot of money, um, and you know, for, for empirical evidence of this, you just go to any of these sorts of auctions that they have, the witches, Wicked Witch's Hat from the Wizard of Oz sold for almost a quarter million dollars, uh, John Lennon's 1963 Beatles suit, you know, $147,000, JFK's rocking chair, $55,000, and so on. But it's really important to know what makes them special. And I gave kind of a rich interpretation. There, there are a variety of possibilities. So uh, there could be something aesthetically pleasing in some cases, like maybe the original Mona Lisa just has a certain aesthetic quality that you could never capture in a reproduction, perhaps. Uh, maybe it's really kind of a social psychological phenomenon. There's snobbery, you want to show where you are, kind of relative to other people, if you can afford this rare thing that makes you special or something. Maybe there's an emotional halo, you know, you really love Elvis, and so anything having to do with Elvis just makes you feel happy, something like that. Or maybe there's some a belief about, you know, whether consciously uh, realized or not, uh, of some invisible connection to the origins of something, or even a sense of magical contagion from origins. And the idea that maybe where something has been in the past still leaves some sort of trace on the object now in the present. Now, I, I do think it is very plausible that, that all of these things are going on to some extent. But I'm going to uh, focus on this last one um, and make a case that that's operating as well. Um, and I would really be remiss not to mention this very important and extended <coughs> work that Paul Rosen has done on the law of contagion. So he talks about how physical contact between a source and a target can, in people's minds, um, result in transfer of some kind of quality, he even actually calls this an essence, uh, from the source to the target. <coughs> this is from a paper by Nemiroff and Rosen. And so they have uh, really fascinating results with adults where people seem to adhere to this belief. So you know, if you have a sterilized cockroach and you dip it in a cup of water, and people know that it's sterilized and so forth. They still don't want to drink the water. Um, and adults report uh, that they really would, don't want to wear the clothing of someone who was unlucky or committed a crime. Classic cases, Hitler's sweater, people don't want to wear it. Um, so um, we did a study, Brandy Frazier and uh, Bruce Hood um, and um, Hood student Wilson, um, where we wanted to see how broad these effects were. And the reason for examining the breadth of the effects is um, to help kind of rule out some interpretations of why people are doing this. Um, so we looked at personal associations, and for each, this, these are just examples, but for each um, example, we have both an authentic item and a control item, um, a famous association, an original creation, and something that was authentic because it's very distant. And then we also asked a variety of questions about each. So um, is it worth keeping? How much would you like to own it? How much would you like to touch it? Uh, what do you think this is worth in dollar amounts? And does this belong in a museum? And part one of our questions is whether authenticity affects uh, reflects some kind of rational economic judgment. So you've learned the market value for certain objects, um, and that's what's going on. But um, to the extent that people, for example, want to touch an item, that couldn't be due to, to some kind of cold rational economic judgment. It could be that people are doing this because of an emotional halo, uh, but then if that's the case, you wouldn't get authenticity effects with items um, uh, such as um, let's see, the distant items, because you don't have any emotional attachment to Mars, um, for example. And you also wouldn't get effects uh, for like the museum and the worth if it's just your personal uh, halo effect. 
And if you just have an overall bias to judge authentic items as better than inauthentic items, then you wouldn't get the effect for uh, like whether personal items should be in a museum display. You should, sorry, if, if it's just an overall global authentic items are better, then you should treat everything as, 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 uh, as, as somehow better if it's authentic. But we included items where you wouldn't expect it, like personal associations in a museum. And uh, when you do this study with college students, that basically you find that with the exception of personal associations, uh, judgments of worth in museum, everything else is high. Uh, it's not just an economic judgment. They want to touch the objects, too. It's not just uh, items that they have a positive association to, because they have this same effect for the distant items and so on. And just to mention, the scale could go from positive 6 to negative 6. I only have five to negative five here. Uh, so anything above zero is showing um, the authenticity effect if it's significantly above the zero. OK, but then, of course, we want to know when this emerges. How fundamental is this way of thinking about objects? And uh, there's good reason to think that maybe children wouldn't understand this. Uh, if you look in the literature on museums and how children interact with museums and what they extract and understand about museums, uh, there's a belief that children don't get authentic items at an early age. Uh, this is from a paper um, in that tradition. And just, you know, kind of base, baseline assertion that, that kids don't get this. But on the other hand, let's go back to the blankie, there's this also this sense in which children do seem to care about certain items as being authentic, and you can't just replace the child's favorite uh, attachment object with another object that looks just like it. And in fact, in our study that I just told you about with adults, we found that um, at the end of the study, we asked adults whether they had an attachment object as a child, and found very strong effects that the people who reported having had an attachment object as a child really showed strong <coughs> authenticity effects. And they were um, the only ones who would, uh, uh, one of the items was, you know, how much is this object worth? And all, you know, most of the subjects dutifully wrote down a dollar amount. But these participants would often write priceless for some of the items. So they, they uh, seem to have like a kind of a more powerful <coughs> sense of authenticity. <coughs> Now, there's a study that was done uh, about nine years ago by Carl Johnson and Jacobs, where uh, it's a very intriguing data point, which is that some children report that Mr. Rogers' sweater is special and belongs in a museum. And they were in Pittsburgh, and Mr. Rogers, a lot of you probably have no idea who he is. There's a <laughs> beloved children's show host. Um, and he was on TV for many years, and he now, he's in Pittsburgh. So these Pittsburgh children uh, thought that we really should put Mr. Rogers' sweater in a museum. And it's a very suggestive finding, but it was only one item. Uh, so Brandy Fraser and I wanted to look at this um, more extensively. And we looked at a range of, of famous associations and original creations. And uh, we found that, indeed, by three years old, they treat these as museum-worthy. So, you know, for example, they might see um, two rubber duckies. This is Ernie's special rubber ducky. This is my sister's rubber ducky that she takes baths with. Uh, or original, cre original creations. This is the very first bicycle that was ever made. It's a brand new bicycle from the bicycle store. And um, children report above chance, even at preschool age, that famous associations belong in a museum, and uh, by kindergarten age, that original creations belong in a museum also. Now, there's uh, an even stronger test of this, uh, this study I really love by uh, Bruce Hood and Paul Bloom, where they looked at uh, how much children give special weight to an authentic object versus an exact duplicate. So they set up this, um, this experimental scenario where kids believed, were led to believe that this machine could, uh, could duplicate things. So if you put 
something in here and close the doors and the bells and whistles go on and then magically a moment later the same thing appears here there are two of them and, and they tell the kids that they've duplicated the object uh, all fine and good kids think this is really interesting and then what they did is um, they put uh, another object in and sometimes that was the child's attachment object from home you know their special blankie or whatever and sometimes it was just a regular object and they uh, of course they couldn't actually copy them so they uh, put them in the, they put it in the machine and said okay after we turn the machine on and make the copy which one are you going to want you're going to want you know this one or that one the original or the copy um, and uh, this is with three to six year olds. Now, if you do the experimenter's toy, most of the time they actually want the duplicate. I think they think it's really cool that this machine can make these exact copies and they'd like to see that copy. Um, if it's their own toy that's not an attachment toy, they also want to see the duplicate. But when it's their own attachment toy, they really want the original. And in fact, this underestimates the effect because a number of the children wouldn't even let the experimenter take the toy away and put it in the machine. Um, so there seems to be this clear recognition that attachment objects have special value above and beyond any uh, perceptible cues. Uh, but I'd like to suggest that there may not be a sharp divide between attachment objects and other owned objects. I think attachment objects are very special uh, for children uh, and even for adults in some ways. But I think this is part of a continuum. And simply stipulating some kind of ownership relationship may get this kind of machine going, in a sense. It may also evoke heightened attention to historical path and heightened emotional attachment. So just by knowing that something is yours, it might make that special to you. Now, there's um, this interesting um, effect called the endowment effect that economists have studied, though they haven't studied it quite in this way with whether attachment is to an individual <coughs> versus to a kind of thing. But uh, basically, the, the effect is if, if you um, give somebody an object and then give them an opportunity to exchange it with a different type of object of equivalent value, uh, people tend to want the thing that, to hold on to the thing that you gave them originally, they think it's better. Um, and you have all the appropriate controls and counterbalancing and so on. Uh, this, this does seem to be uh, quite powerfully in place for adults. So I'm suggesting that ownership per se may um, uh, evoke these kinds of reactions. Now there is a uh, a growing literature on children's ownership concepts. I, Fortunately, we won't have time to go into any of the details, but um, I, I acknowledge some of the people who are, who are doing this very interesting work. And um, suffice it to say that uh, there are proposals out there that children may be using all kinds of cues that are not really what we as adults would use. So current possession may be particularly important to a young child. If you're holding on to something, then, then by by definition, it's yours, or desirability, that they may conflate wanting something and owning something at a very young age. Uh, perceptual functional features may be critical for a child to determine what's theirs. Um, I'm suggesting that original position and historical path will take precedence over these other features. Um, OK. Now, and I, I'll say that I think by about four years of age, it's pretty clear that uh, they've sorted out a lot of this and understand that original possession is more important than current possession, for example. But uh, less work has been done with children under the age of four. So we did a study with two to four-year-olds where we showed children a various stimuli sets uh, with three toys at a time. I don't know how well you can see it, but there, here are three cars. Um, we would um, teach the child, uh, we would give them ownership information. So we would uh, put, for example, the, the order of this, of course, is all varied and counterbalanced. But uh, the experimenter would put this one down and say, this is yours. Put this one down and say, this is mine. 
put this one down and say, look at this. And then right in front of the child, so they can observe the spatiotemporal cues, uh, the, the position of the items is scrambled. So I will try to uh, represent that with the PowerPoint. Okay, so they're scrambled, put on a tray, and the child is asked uh, a question, a set of questions. In the ownership condition, they're simply asked which one is yours, which one is mine. There's also a preference condition, which one do you like best, which one do I like best. And we're interested in what, what information children would use. Would they use historical path as we're predicting, or would they use current possession or desirability or perceptual functional features? Uh, so we had different, item, different types of items that test different combinations of these uh, factors. So I'll go through the items kind of from, I guess you might say, easiest to hardest kind of set. So the easiest set, um, we call these the varied set. They're, the items are completely distinct from each other. Uh, it's, it's kind of trivial. Well, it is trivial for adults. Um, but it does test whether uh, the child is um, using current possession or original possession. So if the child really only cares about who has the object now, then um, they should fail at this because that original cue, this is yours right in front of the child, would be missing. But um, as I said, this is by far the easiest condition. And we find that even two-year-olds have no problem at all. That once you cue something, this is yours, this is mine, um, mix them up and put them in a different order, they do just fine. <coughs> Uh, more interesting are what we call the foil sets. So it'd be like the other one, you know, two really nice, colorful, fun, functional objects, and then something really uh, not so great, like a little piece of wood or a piece of cardboard or a piece of styrofoam. Um, and unfortunately for the child, that was the one that was designated as theirs. Um, so, um, you know, so it was always the, the, the foil that was provided to the child. And of course, this allows us to tease apart desirability from original possession and historical path. Uh, in a way, I wish uh, I could show you the adult data first and go backwards, but I couldn't figure out how to make PowerPoint do that. So I'll, I'll start with uh, the most interesting results, which are the <coughs> two-year-olds. Um, OK, well, the fact that they did well in the experimenter's item is not a surprise at all. That's completely just replicating the prior type of item because the experimenter always got one of the good items. Um, <coughs> the two-year-olds actually uh, rejected, or this was, put it this way, they did not select the one designated as their own above chance. Now, either this means that they think desirability is more important, or maybe there was some sort of, um, uh, maybe they had some sort of inhibition problem but they really wanted to reach for something more interesting. <laughs> Whatever it was, the two-year-olds uh, failed on the foil items. But by three, they have no problem with it at all. They don't you know, necessarily like the foil items, but they, uh, it was designated as theirs. Uh, they track that, and they keep it as theirs. And of course, the adults do really well. And then this, uh, to me, this was the most interesting set. This is when the items were identical. So in order to uh, get this right, you have to really carefully track uh, the, the position of the items. And it's, you know, it doesn't look that hard, but it's, it's not all that easy either. And um, you have to, you know, you, the child could just say, well, I got a yellow car. I was told that I have a yellow car. Now there are three yellow cars. I'll just pick the one closest to me. Uh, it doesn't matter. Um, but here's what they do. Even the two-year-olds very carefully monitor the placement of the objects. The one that had been designated as theirs, they get, well, two-thirds of the time, they get the right one. Now, they don't get it for the experimenter's toy even though the information was identical and half the time the experimenter's toy was labeled. 
before the uh, participants and half the time after. So there's the, that special attention seems to be for an object that is designated as belonging to the child. Uh, but, but they get the, the, the basic principle. Uh, by three, they're doing well for the participant and the experimenter and uh, the adult as well. Although I will say, you know, obviously this is a big uh, difference. Uh, this is a significant difference as well. So even at three, they're not quite as good as paying, atten at paying attention to the experimenter. And this is not a significant difference, but the only errors at all for the adults were for the <coughs> experimenter items. So they're even for adults, and this is not quite as attentive when it's not yours. Now the question, the other condition, which one do you like best? And this tests the endowment effect. If something is designated as yours, does it then become more desirable? Um, and this was our kind of crude initial attempt to assess this. And um, just to remind you for the foil, I, here I'm just showing the participants' toy trials uh, for, for simplicity. On the foil trials, um, remember this was the, the very boring, uh, unattractive item. And we only have three-year-olds and adults because the two-year-olds uh, are still in process, still being tested. So um, this is actually a good thing, I think, that uh, neither three-year-olds nor adults report that they like the foil item. So this is showing that they're not just, there's not just some response bias to always pick the thing that was labeled as theirs. They really don't like this item, uh, and they're, they're reporting that. However, for both the varied sets and the identical sets, uh, there is an increased preference for the item that's designated as their own. Uh, the adults actually don't significantly show this effect with the varied sets, only the three-year-olds do. Uh, when they're the same, clearly the one that had been designated as theirs is, is the one that they like better. Um, But spatiotemporal cues, this was all about spatiotemporal cues and attention to that. They're not always available. Um, and so we also wanted to know if children will consult the cues to the historical path when, you, when they aren't able to track an object through space and time. Do they look for traces to, uh, to ownership? And here I just have like a little pilot data and um, you don't want to interpret it too much because I think there's some important controls missing, but uh, I'll just get, I'll just kind of lay this out. Um, in this experiment, children saw two identical objects. One of them was labeled as their own. Uh, this is yours. Look at this. And then, as the child is watching, the experimenter takes the child's object and intentionally puts a little hidden mark either inside or underneath the object. So like a tiny little pencil mark inside of a book or a sticker underneath a toy ladybug. Then the two objects are put on a spinner. There's an opaque lid put on. The whole thing is spun around so you can't tell you know, which is which. The lid is removed and the child is asked, which one is yours? And what they see are two identical objects. So they could think, oh, you know, this is just too much trouble. I've, I'm going to go with the one closest to me, or it doesn't matter, they look the same. Or they could um, do the extra work to consult the trace of the historical path. Um, and what we found is that they almost always get it right. And this is with four and five year olds, by the way. And they get it right because they're checking. They check on almost every trial. Now, there's. Aside from the fact that they are checking, the other interesting point is their pattern of checking. Because um, they have a bias to search for positive evidence for the trace. And uh, there are probably numerous interpretations of this. But one possibility is that um, they're not just trying to differentiate the objects. Remember, there are two objects. So if you check one and there's nothing, if there's no mark there, you know the other one uh, has to be your own object. But uh, I think what's going on is that children have this uh, need to search for the historical trace, and only one object has the historical trace. So 
uh, I'm going to show you how often they checked either their own object, <coughs> the distractor object, or first their own, then the distractor, or first the distractor, and then their own, or other patterns. These are the only two things they would need to do. And they do check, if, they, if the first one they pick up, of course this is random, first one they pick up is their own, uh, they do that about almost half the time. They very rarely only check their, uh, the other one. They never, if they got first, if they checked it, they saw it had the mark, they never then went and checked the other one. But if they first got the one without the mark, they almost always then checked for the one with the mark. And then a, a few of the times, they, they just did something altogether different. So there they, you know, there, there's that, that positive bias. OK, so let me bring it back to the conclusions. I think tracing historical path has broad implications for identity, authenticity, ownership. Uh, I think these implications are basic to the human conceptual system. A lot of work, none of it done by me, showing that this is present in infancy. And returning to the question I started with, I think essentialism is probably not just a biological uh, modular adaptation. There are a lot of open questions. Uh, I'll just point to a few of them. Um, I think it would be uh, interesting to know when children place particular value on original objects when in childhood that emerges, and what other kinds of values objects have for young children. <coughs> And whether owned or authentic items are thought to have some kind of literal trace of the original owner, like Rosin has shown with adults. Are there some kind of either material, causal, or magical powers that are attributed to an item that has gone, that has gone through a particular historical path? And given that um, the original owner of the object seems to, seems to be really important in determining how valuable something is, uh, you can use this as um, a, a way of looking at what kinds of social features young children think are important to give an object either greater or lesser value. And the, the, the question I want to end with is whether attachment to authentic objects is fundamentally an irrational kind of uh, uh, perspective. So, I would like to argue that it is, that privileging authenticity is irrational. Uh, in the very, you know, in the very least, it's ir irrational and that's not tied to anything material or functional about an object. Whatever path it has traversed doesn't actually leave an imprint on the objects around us, but we treat these objects as if they do have these imprints. Now, um, it, could, it could still be irrational sort of belief. So if you think that um, if something was owned by uh, a beloved figure, that it has some special magical qualities, it's an erroneous belief, but a rational inference. Or you could think, well, you know, I really liked this person. I have their possession. That makes me feel happy. It's just an emotional response. Again, that could be a rational response, but I don't think that's the whole story. Now, these, if these are irrational, it's kind of striking that they don't decline with age or experience. And I think, but I really don't know, I, I, I don't know what uh, people, who, people like Mike who study non-human animals would say, but it doesn't seem to me that they form these same kinds of attachments. And so it might be that when reasoning about historical path, humans are actually less rational than other species. And that's where I want to end. Thank you. Uh, I'm very interested. What do you think about uh, change, twins, phenomenon, subjective psychological phenomenon, 
um, varies here the change the, the change the, is the individual essentiality. What do I think that change? Um, the twins uh, says I have changed in 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 my in my nature. I have changed in my in my burn. Very very often phenomenon is in the uh, at the twins. Can somebody help me? I'm not sure I understood this. Probably the, the problem is that uh, we have an idea that, that we were we, we, we do not belong to our parents, right? We were changed in the uh, after birth. Oh, a belief that you are not you are not the the person you, you oh, are supposed yes, to be. Yes. Well. Um, Part of our concept of individuals is enormous change, absolutely. Um, and so there's no question about that. And what's striking is the idea that despite all of that change, there's nonetheless something essential that's not changing. That's, you know, some core thing that persists throughout the lifetime that doesn't change for an individual. And um, you know, you could have different beliefs about um, what what that core is doing and whether it has any causal force or not. So if you're strongly essentialist about individuals, then you would say, uh, yes, you're undergoing change, but to some extent, perhaps that essential quality of you is directing that change. So you, the change itself can even be seen as evidence for the constancy. Um, and we often, you know, these horrible cases where there's like a serial killer or something, they always go back and ask, you know, the, the, uh, the neighborhood, well, what was he like as a kid? And they, people always retrospectively say, oh, yeah, you know, he was a little odd or, you know. Um, I think people look for that, 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 that kind of constancy over the change. Um, so in a way, um, you know, if, if people were literally unchanging, if they were like, you know, a block of wood over time and just not changing at all, um, you wouldn't even really have to appeal to any kind of essence. It, it, it's, some have argued that um, one thing that provokes essentialism is not so much the commonalities that members of the category share, but the differences that are so apparent despite the fact that, for example, we give them all the same label. Um, so it, it, in, in this kind of paradoxical way, it's, it's that variety and changeability and, and, and lack of stability that uh, might best uh, kind of promote that essentialist uh, perspective. So it's an yeah, interesting dimension. Yes, so I, I wonder about the... Uh, um you know, the nature of the, this very neat and strong effect of the attachment object, which, you know, psychoanalytic circles, uh, since Winnicott, they called it the transitional object. Right. And uh, these transitional objects uh, uh, in that framework, what is emphasized is that uh, um, they are, in a sense, under the perfect control of the child. So they are uh, the extensions or the representations of the self uh, so that's one of the reasons why any change in them can only be uh, 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 accepted if you made that change. So you cannot be what my mother, etc. Uh, and it's just like if I would be asked whether I want to step into Paul Bloom's, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> duplicating machine, which one I want to come out uh, from, <laughs> you know. I <laughs> so one is, is kind of there is a. a, a, a so, so whether this this really boils down to to the uh, to uh, self identity and the, the his, uh, historical sense of self identity being uh, kind of traced or or made uh, uh, accentuated or visible or traceable by uh, uh, associations to objects that you own or owned uh, and uh, uh, and uh, what what drives it really is a, 
is, is self-identity and are the important for us to to keep uh, our um, you know the traces that allow us to uh, to know it was me it's still me it's gonna be me etc. Mm. I uh, I go to sleep and it's not another person that wakes up uh, and we wouldn't like that so I think yes I, I completely agree we wouldn't like it as an aside um, Bruce Hood had told me that he was really tr hoping that he could do the duplicating machine with the child's mother. But he hadn't gotten it through IRB yet. I don't, I'm not sure if he ever will. Um, <laughs> IRB is a little more lax. <laughs> um, well, I mean, it, you tell a plausible story that it's related to the self. I mean, what, what could be really more important in some ways than our, our notion of self? Uh, seems plausible to me. On the, on the other hand, this is so, it's so over-determined that we need to track identity um, because we need it just, you know, every aspect of just navigating our environment. Um, you know, identifying family members as an infant, you know, from one point to the next. Um, knowing that when an object goes behind an occluder, it's still there. You know, it, it, it's just, it seems so fundamental to me that I don't, I'm not willing to privilege the self aspect over the others, but um, I, I have to say it's a very interesting thought. Um, it's appealing. The attachment object, an, another interpretation, though, interestingly, uh, that some people have proposed is that it may be um, a substitute for uh, the mother, I mean, that's also an interpretation that's put, been put out there. And if you look at cultures where the child co-sleeps with the parents, uh, they report lower rates of, holding, of having an attachment object. Um, so sometimes that attachment object is either something that has been given to the child from the parent, or even literally an object that belonged to the parent uh, that the child holds on to. Um, so you, you could argue it that way as well. And, um, you know, I don't think that we're, we or, or infants, I think few people aside from philosophers are going around questioning their sense of self to, the, to that extent of, you know, well, would I still be myself, if, uh, you know, under these transformations and so on. So that may be so um, just basic that I don't know if that argues for that being the root to this sort of thing or if it, it, it just says well you don't really even uh, need to you, you have all of these sensory cues and so forth that you're still the same person that maybe you don't even really need to uh, track uh, other kinds of spatiotemporal cues. Okay, only two more questions. Um, I have a question to your very last experiment. So um, um, where you show that uh, actually children search for a, for a mark uh, for a, to track the historical history of the of the object, so they search for for the mark in the book, um, and they don't use exclusivity. So how can you be sure that they search for a, a sign uh, in general, or they search for a sign in, in for mindness? So yeah. do you have a condition where the mark actually marks the experimental store? I, I want to, and, yeah. yeah, no, exactly. And then the sign I, we for, for minus is nothing, actually, right. is, is no sign, and whether they can, can use that. Right, right. Now, I, exactly, that's one of the controls that I think is missing at this point. So this is work in progress, and I think that's a, a great idea and um, something that we want to follow up with. So we don't have the, the results yet. I, I would like to question the idea that it's irrational to prefer an object because uh, just of the historical path between it uh, and, uh, and us. I mean, you know, in the rational choice theory, you can prefer anything for, for whatever reason. What's wrong with preferring mm. just for that? Why, do you, why does it have to have some present, uh, uh, causally active property uh, uh, that differentiates it from uh, 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 what would be otherwise a, a, a perfect copy. Let, let, let me, okay. so, so, so far, I, I won't say a, a drawing by Matisse, 
And I, li I like the fact that it's told you it was actually handled by the teacher. Like, it's not because it makes me feel good, it's because this happened that I feel good. It's not the other way around. I don't, uh, and just to, 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 uh, we care about the social relationship, not just over the past, but also over the future. You prefer to think uh, that your great great grandchild uh, will win the lottery rather than be hit uh, uh, in, uh, die in a car in, in accident. Why? Is it, is it irrational? I don't think it's a rational thing. We do, uh, our sense, uh, uh, the, 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 the non causally potent properties are also part of what defines us. And so I prefer to be the uh, ancestor of a child who will live happy rather than, uh, than die unhappily, uh, and, and so on and so on. So, so there's nothing irrational. And then and the relevance of that is then it's irrelevant to, to essentials. Oh, it, that? Okay, I was following you up to that. Yes. <laughs> that seems a leap to me. That, well, okay, so first let me say um, rationality. You know, I know that I really don't know anything about rationality. Okay, so this is, uh, at least from the standpoint of um, a justifiable causal implication, there, there's you know, and there's a lack of a material difference, and there's a lack of a uh, of a functional difference. Um, but you still have this preference, and you can rule out you know other alternatives. Then um, I, I don't know what it means to be rational for it to still to to have that be a rational um, preference. But but okay. But if 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 um, we accept that it's rational. I don't see why that's why that severs the link to essentialism. Well, it does because it suggests that all the, the, uh, the that all, all these essentialist bits that get into the story that people will tell you that are evidence in experiments are rationalizations or elaborations, which may themselves not be rational, but they are not needed uh, for one to actually prefer something because of the of the sort of path that relates to, to us in the past or in the future. So, that's it. So, so, so it's not essential to uh, this uh, the preference for historical part that they should be essential. Oh, 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 I see what you're saying. Um, yes, I think the other way around, though, I, I see. So you're saying that um, to call that preference for essential for historical path essentialist would, would no longer be necessary. But I think for um, this preference for historical path to be psychologically part of what uh, is one of the strands of essentialism would still be the case. Thank you very much. Uh, see you back here at 3.30 or see you over there. Thank you.